Well, by way of introduction to our message today, I want to give us an update on the Trellis Project. You may remember several months ago, we introduced to you the vision for the future of our church that God has given those that He has raised up to lead our church as we've been prayerfully strategizing how to accommodate and facilitate the spiritual and physical growth of Lakeside Bible Church. And we decided to call this vision The Trellis Project, based on a book uh, that was written uh, back in 2009 called The Trellis and the Vine. A number of us read that when it, was first, when it first came out, and since then it's become a, a ministry blueprint of sorts for many churches like ours. Uh, the authors of this helpful book use the relationship between a trellis and a vine as a metaphor for how to grow a strong, healthy, thriving church. The vine represents the disciple-making work of preaching and teaching God's Word and the power of God's Spirit so people are converted to Christ and grow to maturity in Christ. The, the trellis represents the organizational structures, the programs, the facilities that, that support the vine and enable it to develop and flourish. And in order for the vine to thrive, the trellis needs to be modified or expanded from time to time. And as we've all seen over the past year or so, God has been directing a lot of new people to our church. And in light of the sacred responsibility that we believe God has entrusted to us to care for their souls, we've been praying how to best minister to our growing congregation. And so we decided to implement a series of short-term, mid-term, and long-term plans for the life of our church. The long-term plan... Uh, is to build third phase. And uh, in order to solve our, our present space issues, um, help us in, uh, and to help us envision how to modify and expand our present facilities to reach and teach more people um, in our community, which is just exploding around us, uh, we hired uh, Crosspoint Church Architects to analyze our needs and to provide us some creative options. And so now we have... Uh, an updated master plan which fully utilizes uh, the remainder of the 12 acres that we have um, that the Lord blessed us with originally 22 years ago. And uh, it, it completes the third and final phase of that original master plan. Um, th the main feature of that plan is, is a new worship center uh, solely dedicated to ministering the word through music and preaching along with a secure self-contained children's center where kids can be trained up to love and live for Jesus. And that's something that we wanted to make a priority. Uh, right now, our children's leaders have requested if there was a way that we could somehow consolidate our uh, children's ministry so it wasn't so spread out, it was more secure in and out. Um, and so that was something that we wanted to try to remedy if we could uh, as soon as possible. So that was why we wanted to build in a new children's center there with our worship center. So this is um, an exciting opportunity. It's a daunting project. Uh, it's going to require uh, God's providential provision along with an enormous amount of faith and sacrifice on our part. But from the beginning, uh, our church has adopted the motto of the famous pioneer missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, who said this, God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. And like Taylor, for the past 22 years, we have been testing the promises of God, and he has proven himself faithful to provide everything that we enjoy today, all debt-free, by the grace of God, so that we, so, so we are confident as we move into the future that God can be trusted and will continue to glorify himself by doing above and beyond anything we could ask for or even imagine. Uh, that's our long-term plan, which is, by the way, on display now uh, in the hallway connecting the uh, first phase and the second phase, and we wanted to put those images uh, up where we could all see them to hopefully excite us and motivate us to pray and give towards this future building project. So I want to encourage you to uh, spend some time just kind of familiarizing yourself with that project and, and what we're uh, looking towards in the future. Um, in the meantime... Uh, we felt the need to create a pathway for growth in order to make that long-term plan more feasible. And so we came up with a short-term plan 
and a midterm plan to provide time and space for our church to extend its impact not only in our lives, but in the lives of others in our community. So uh, our short-term plan uh, is what we're doing right now. Um, in order to address the, the current space challenges that we've had uh, to eliminate anyone having to attend church in an overflow space, uh, back in October we decided to transition to two services, and now you are part of the second service, right? And so um, it, while we know it's not a perfect plan, right, we're still all learning to adjust our schedules and our, uh, our preferences, manage our expectations. I think by God's grace it seems to be going smoothly so far. Uh, we've already mentioned this, we wish there was a, a more equal dis- distribution between the two services, but we chose to stagger the equipping classes the way that they are in order to allow families to worship together. We didn't want kids having to be by themselves or cut off from their parents, and so hopefully you appreciate that priority uh, as we made those decisions. But this has definitely given us room to breathe and to grow, uh, particularly here in our second service, and uh, I personally love the extended time of fellowship uh, that we uh, get to have between the services. I think more people are uh, involved in equipping classes than ever before. In fact, I stand out here after first service, and I don't know why I'm standing out there, because nobody's going out that way anymore. They're all going this way, which is a good thing. That's where we want everybody to go. And so uh, thank you for your flexibility and just following the the leadership as we implemented that short-term plan. Now it's time to implement the midterm plan. And another way we decided to buy ourselves some time and space to grow and expand um, as we look toward building a new worship center, a new children's center, uh, was to build a student center to house our next level in 220 ministries. And this is not even in the plans on the wall there. Uh, This is kind of what we've been calling like a 2.5 plan. And uh, what this will do is free up Two of our largest uh, classrooms, uh, basically that whole student wing there, um, for the children's ministry to perhaps expand or definitely for adult ministries to use for special classes and events. Um, And just so you know, we wrestled with the idea of transforming uh, at some point in the future the worship center uh, and also the present nursery area uh, into a space dedicated for our student ministry. Um, But the more we thought about it, talked about it, prayed about it, We thought it would be wiser to preserve that worship space as sort of a chapel for weddings and funerals, which is just, uh, God's just blessed that area Uh, over the years. It's been a special space uh, that we didn't want to lose, and uh, so we decided to keep that there, and so let's build it out of our present uh, footprint uh, where uh, the, the, the playgrounds are right now out there. And so the elders have approved a tentative floor plan. Uh, It's approximately 4,800 square foot, um, equipped with bathrooms, a kitchenette, uh, much needed storage space. Um, And again, uh, we got an estimated cost for the project. Uh, It's around uh, $650,000. The good news is we have about 150, at least 150 of that already um, in our savings. So we need to still raise about $500,000. $500,000. So uh, this week, the elders unanimously agreed to move forward uh, with this project by getting the blueprints drawn up uh, so that we can be ready to begin the site work as soon as we have half the money um, contributed. So we're hoping that uh, in the near future, uh, God would lay it upon all of our hearts to contribute uh, $250,000, which would kind of get us uh, to the halfway point. Uh, so that we could uh, at least put a shovel in the ground and get that moving. Because our original goal was to break ground in January so that the students could move into this thing next fall, which, again, is not um, impossible. Uh, God could do that if he would like to, and so that would be uh, our, um, you know, human goal, right? We make our plans, the Lord directs our steps, but uh, we want to break ground as soon as possible so the students can move, that in, move in there as soon as, as, as soon as possible. Well, this week the elders also, uh, as we talked and prayed about all this, encouraged me to take the next two Sundays to preach on the subject of giving in order to stimulate all of us to consider perhaps giving a year-end gift. This is a, a time of year 
uh, where churches and ministries um, that we're blessed by will appeal, make an appeal to give a year-end gift. And so we want to do that um, uh, and ask you to consider prayerfully uh, a gift that is above and beyond your normal giving uh, towards this next step in the Trellis Project. So with that in mind, take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Now, it's three weeks before Christmas. Most, if not all of us, are consumed with finding the perfect gift for our loved ones. If you're a child, you're probably looking forward to most about Christmas, um, and that is opening your presents. That's what I look forward to most when I was growing up. But as we get older... uh, Christmas becomes less about getting gifts and more about giving gifts. And we find great joy in seeing the reaction of someone as they open up a gift that we gave them and they scream or they jump up and down or they do a little dance or they run over and hug us and they say, this is the best gift ever. But maybe you have witnessed or experienced yourself that rare moment when someone received a gift from you that left them speechless or maybe someone gave you a gift that left you speechless. You were so overwhelmed. You were moved by the generosity of the gift. You didn't know what to say. I mean, the gift was so amazing. It was, it was too wonderful for words, and all that you could think to say was, thank you. Well, that is how Paul reacted when he contemplated the generous gift of salvation that God had provided him through his son, Jesus Christ. Read with me 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is one of the richest statements in all the, the word of God, and uh, this verse is often found on Christmas cards with a message Uh, about how God has given us the gift of his son, but what you may not realize is that this is the culmination of the most concentrated instruction on giving in the entire Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 is the premier passage on giving in the New Testament. And the background of this text is interesting. Uh, One of the greatest projects that God used Paul to accomplish Uh, during his three missionary journeys was to collect an offering for the famine-stricken saints in Jerusalem. And so as as he traveled around to the various churches uh, he had planted, uh, Paul asked the believers there in those churches to donate money to help their suffering brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. In fact, Paul told the Corinthian church about this collection uh, in his previous letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Verse 1, he said, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. Well, between the time he wrote that in 1 Corinthians and now writing 2 Corinthians, Paul had visited Macedonia, church, uh, churches in Macedonia, churches in Philippi, churches in Thessalonica, uh, the church in Berea, uh, and he was blown away that in spite of their own poverty, they gave more generously, more joyously, more sacrificially than anyone he'd ever seen before in his life. And so now Paul used their example to instruct and inspire the church in Corinth to contribute to the collection for the Jerusalem church. Notice, I just want to read a portion of chapter 8 and chapter 9 to point out the emphasis on the word grace or gracious. So watch with me as we read uh, verses 1 through 7. This is 2 Corinthians 8, 1. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Macedonia. 
that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well, but just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and the love which we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. Look at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through he, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And then jump over to verse 19. Paul says this. He has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work, which is being administered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness. And then jump over to chapter 9, verse 7. Each one must do just as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Verse 10, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all while they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. So notice how Paul bookends this teaching on or instruction on giving with the phrase the grace of God. Verse chapter 8 verse 1 talking about the grace of God which was shown in the churches of Macedonia and now chapter 9 verse 14 He's talking about the grace of God in the church in Corinth. This is where uh, the, the term grace giving is drawn from, a term that I want to expand on in the next couple of weeks with you. But notice, again, as Paul is concluding this instruction on grace giving, his mind naturally went to the extreme expression of grace giving. And that is God generously and joyously and sacrificially giving up his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross so we could be saved. No one has ever given or will ever give us as much as God has given us in Christ. There is no greater gift than Christ himself. And at this point, Paul did what he so often did in his letters. Whenever he was writing about God's grace, he would get caught up in wonder and awe, and he would burst forth in praise and thanksgiving. And so he says in verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, his unspeakable gift gift, his inexpressible gift, his ineffable gift, his gift that is beyond description. It's a gift that's too wonderful for words. I find it interesting that that word indescribable, this is the only time that that word is used in the Bible. In fact, it's it's never even used in classical Greek writing. It's as if Paul made up this word in an effort to describe the indescribable. The only word that comes close to it is a word that we've already, or I should say we've recently studied in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, where Peter said, though you may not, though, and though you have not seen him, you love him, though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. In other words, no matter how articulate or eloquent a person might be, no one is capable of fully describing God's gracious gift of salvation in Christ. It's simply overwhelming. It's breathtaking. It's amazing. It's awesome. It's marvelous. It's too wonderful for words. And so with that as our 
background, I want us to consider together what the Bible teaches about the responsibility God's people have to support God's work with their financial gifts. Giving back to God a a portion of what he has given to us is one of the most fundamental principles of the Christian life. And unfortunately, the subject of giving money to the church has become highly controversial because throughout church history, the concept of, of giving, or, or maybe you, we could call it tithes and offering, has, has been distorted and corrupted mainly by greedy false teachers who are clearly in the ministry for the money. From Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, who thought he could purchase the power of God with money, to, to Johann Tetzel, who was the driving force behind the sale of indulgences to to, to build St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome during the 1500s. And this was, uh, he was the, 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 the main, um, I guess, subject of those 95 theses that, that, uh, that Martin Luther nailed to the, to the door of his church was the sale. He was, uh, it was a tirade against the selling of indulgences. And then I think of the televangelists today who live in, luxury and promise their followers the same kind of prosperity if they'll just send them a little more money every month. And so in order to avoid the stereotype of churches always asking for money, we as a church have purposely not talked a whole lot about money. Uh, Ever since we planted this church, we decided we were never going to pass an offering plate In fact, we've never owned offering plates. Uh, We decided just to put a box in the back. That's how it all started, was just a box in the back, and people had to find it to give. And now we have a number of boxes uh, around where uh, you are able to give discreetly without any external pressure from anyone. In fact, I heard a story uh, about a church board that was frustrated by the lack of giving from the members of their, their congregation, so they decided to come up with a new offering system And instead of passing offering place, they decided to put a box by the front door so people could give as they came in or or went out. Um, But this was no ordinary offering box. If you dropped in $20, nothing happened. But if you put in less than that, a siren would go off. And if you walked by and put nothing in it, it took your picture. Now, obviously, that's not true, right? But... No church should ever rig their offering box with a siren or, or a camera to motivate their people to give. And, and the main reason for that is the Bible clearly teaches that what you give to the Lord is between you and the Lord. And no one else should know what you give or even that you give. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 quickly with me. Matthew chapter 6. This is uh, what Jesus had to say about giving in the Sermon on the Mount. And do you know that Jesus talked more about giving than he did um, what we would consider even more important subjects like heaven and hell? Uh, Money was something that was very important um, and how we use the money that God uh, has blessed us with is very important to Christ. In Matthew chapter 6, this is what he said, verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them, otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. In other words, don't be a spiritual show-off. He said, verse 2, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by them. Truly, I say to you, they, may, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's a common practice in our day to put contributors' names on plaques and bricks and pews and to name schools and buildings after large donors and to send special letters uh, or make special phone calls to to thank the really big givers. I think these are well-intentioned practices, but they seem to contradict the very thing that Christ condemned in this passage and unwittingly, perhaps, rob people of their heavenly reward. I think this is just one example of 
of the fact that many Christians today misunderstand what the Bible teaches about giving. Uh, Another example is the concept of tithing, giving 10% of your income back to the Lord. And and many good Bible teaching churches like ours promote tithing as the basic standard for how much their members should give. Um, That's why a lot of Christians assume that giving 10% is the mandatory amount that, that God requires from every believer. But I want to challenge you with this thought. The the practice of tithing as a permanent principle that is binding in all Christians today is not taught in Scripture. Now some of you may, that may sound radical to your ears. It might even sound heretical (laughs) to your ears. Let let me explain what I mean by that. The, the, The concept of tithing is taught in the Old Testament. And what I want to do is just provide a quick overview of the original pattern of giving that God prescribed for his people in the Old Testament. And I think this will serve as a good foundation for what we're going to see here in 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 8 and 9. And so let's just begin by looking at giving before the law, okay? Giving before the law. Uh, in, In Old Testament times, Uh, People acknowledge God's ownership of their lives and property by a payment of a tithe, um, giving a a tenth of everything they owned. And and, and just so you know, this was not just those who worshiped Yahweh. Giving a tenth to a deity was the common custom of many pagan religions back then, and historical records show that the Egyptians did it, the Chaldeans did it, the Assyria, Assyrians, they all tithe uh, their goods. They gave 10% to their gods. And so the, so the principle of tithing was not necessarily something that originated with God, if you will. It, it started long before God ever prescribed it in the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. In fact, the, the, the Hebrew word tithe first appears in Genesis chapter 14, Uh, verse 20, uh, in the account of Abraham and Melchizedek. Genesis chapter 14, uh, verse 17 says, then after his return, this is the return of Abraham, from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He was a, a type of Christ Uh, a picture of Christ in the Old Testament here. He blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And verse 20 says, he gave him a tenth of all. So Abraham was so indebted to God for all that he had done for him and how he had protected him and for the opportunity to meet this priest Melchizedek, that he joyfully and gratefully gave a tenth of all the spoils of battle to the Lord. And he let Melchizedek offer that up to the Lord that day. Abraham's tithe was free, it was voluntary, and it was motivated from a glad, grateful heart, not as a divine command. We see this word a second time in Genesis chapter 28, when Jacob was fleeing from his brother Saul or Esau after deceiving his father, Isaac. And if you remember, he was out in the wilderness and he went to sleep and he had a dream and the angels were climbing the ladder. We, we know it as Jacob's ladder, right? And this is uh, Genesis chapter 28. After, or the next day, this is what it says, verse 18, Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on his top. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I will return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So here Jacob was asking God to provide him with food and clothing and a safe passage, and he promised God that if he did, that he would give him a tenth of all of it. 
Now, based on those two examples of Abraham and Jacob, some would argue that tithing is still binding on Christians today because their tithing or these examples um, were pre-law. In other words, they didn't originate with the law, which is true, but being circumcised and offering sacrifices were also practiced before God mandated them in the law, and I don't think anyone's ready to argue that that being circumcised and offering sacrifices are still binding for us today. And like circumcision and like offering sacrifices, tithing was incorporated into the law. So let's look at giving under the law. Giving under the law. When God gave the law to the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai, he required each of them to tithe, to give 10%. But you may be surprised to know that God actually required far more than just 10% from the Israelites. There there were multiple mandatory giving requirements laid out for them in the Old Testament. Uh, There are three basic tithes the Israelites were required to pay, and we don't have time to look at each of these uh, in specific, and that's why I put the references there in your notes So you can check up on me to make sure I'm not making this stuff up. Um, But the three tithes were this. Number one was the Levite's tithe. According to Leviticus 27, Numbers 18, every Jew had to give a tenth of everything they owned to provide for the Levites who served in the tabernacle and temple and had no time to work outside of their their day job, if you will, um, as as priests and as as, uh, laborers in the temple. And so they were to be provided for Secondly, there was the festival tithe. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 12. When Israel inhabited the promised land, God added this requirement that they were to give a tenth um, of their resources to pay for the public festivals that they celebrated throughout the year. And there was a lot of those. Uh, The Jews liked to party a lot. uh, And they have all sorts of feasts and festivals. And so he required them to give towards those festivals. Thirdly, there was the poor tithe. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, every three years, God required them to give another 10% to support those who couldn't provide for themselves. In other words, to care for the widows and the orphans, the, those who were less fortunate. This could have been kind of a, 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 the, the pre-welfare, uh, I guess, concept. Uh, but since this tithe was uh, 10% every three years, it came to 3.3% per year, Bringing the total amount God required them to give, if you're doing the math, we're up to 23%. And along with these three mandatory tithes, God also required the Israelites to refrain from harvesting the corners of their fields or picking all the grapes from their vineyards in order to leave uh, some gleanings for the poor to gather. We see that in Leviticus 19. In fact, that's what Ruth was doing when she met Boaz. In addition to this, there were other taxes that were required uh, for the Israelites to pay from time to time. For example, in Nehemiah chapter 10, there was a tax of a third of a shekel to offset the cost of the materials used to present the offerings in the temple. So, again, if you're doing the math, the combined total of those three primary tithes along with the other small tithes was over 25%. That's a lot more than the standard 10% that is mistakenly cited as the amount God requires us to give. I don't think that's where I'm going. Like, okay, so the standard here at Lakeside Bible Church is 25%, okay? That's not where I'm going. Um, Where I'm going is I want to point out to you that these ties were not an offering in the strict sense of the term but an obligation placed on everyone by the law. And and they were essentially nothing more than taxes used to fund the national government, which just happened to be a theocracy at the time. And yet this still wasn't the total amount of giving that God required of his people under the Mosaic law. God expected 
the Israelites to give voluntarily to him above and beyond the mandatory 25% tithe or tax. There was what's called the first fruit offerings. We see that in Numbers chapter 18, verse 12. God required Israelites, the Israelites to dedicate the first of their crops or livestock to him. And, and the beautiful thing about that was that they did that before the rest of the harvest came in. In other words, they just gave whatever came up first and they gave that unto the Lord, not knowing what the rest of the harvest would look like or how it would turn out. But they gave their best to God and and trusted him to bring in the rest. Proverbs 3, 9 says it this way, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. I think that proverb there turns this into an abiding principle that we too should give the Lord the first and the best of all that we earn or receive by way of our gifts and our offerings. In other words, we need to give God first, not last. Reminds me of the story I heard of a little girl whose daddy gave her $2 bills and said, honey, one of these belongs to God and one of these you can do with with it whatever you want. And she was really excited and so she took off running towards the candy store. And along the way, she tripped and, and she stumbled and, uh, you know, that one of those dollar bills slipped out of her hands and went down into the gutter. And she immediately said, God, I'm sorry about your dollar. And went off to the candy store, right, with her dollar. And I think too many of us as Christians give God whatever's left at the end of the month In other words, God ends up getting our leftovers, whereas I think all of us should get into the habit that as soon as we get our paycheck or some um, perhaps tax return or or some kind of return on an investment or uh, maybe even a gift, the the first thing we think about is, is, well, how can I give, how much of this can I give back to the Lord? And the the first check we write is not our, our rent check or our mortgage payment or electric bill or our phone bill, but our, but our offering check. I, I don't know about how you guys do your budget, but in our budget, we, we have the, you know, the income and, 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 and the expense category. And, and the very top thing in the expense category is giving, right? Giving to the church, giving to missions, giving whatever the Lord lays on your heart. But that is above, that takes priority over your mortgage payment, it takes priority over your, uh, you know, your, your light bill, your, your, your internet service, and everything else, right? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean you don't have to pay all those other things you do, right? But it's, it's just, a, I think, a, a mindset that we need to have that the Lord comes first. So there's this, there's this first fruit offering. There's also a thing called a free will offering. Um, Exodus 25 is a great example um, God told Moses to build the tabernacle, uh, this temporary place of worship as they traveled throughout the wilderness, a place where they could meet with God. And, and, uh, and so he gave, them, he gave them very specific instructions of how to build that. He also uh, commanded the people to donate money and supplies toward the building of the tabernacle. And he gave no specific amount. They simply were to give whatever amount God prompted them to give. They didn't need to be browbeaten into giving. Uh, they, they just sensed the greatness of the cause and, and responded so generously that, that Moses had to tell them to stop giving. When's the last time you ever went to church and the pastor got up and said, hey folks, you know, you're, you're just giving too much. You can stop, okay? We've got more than enough. Well, that's the way it was in the Old Testament, and I think the people were just overwhelmed with God's grace in delivering them from Egypt. In fact, he told them to ask the Egyptians for their gold when they left, and I think that gold ultimately was to be invested back into his temple, into his, in his tabernacle. So in the Old Testament, we see that God laid down a pattern of giving that included both mandatory giving and voluntary giving, mandatory giving and voluntary giving. And he treated this pattern of giving very seriously. He expected his people to take it very seriously as well. In fact, when his people failed to give him what he required of them, he accused them of robbery. Malachi chapter three, um, and would punish them severely. There's some 
great passages to consider. Malachi chapter 3 is one of them. Haggai chapter 1 is another. Maybe we can look at that at a, at a later time when we get ready to, to, to go for the big dog down the street here um, with third phase. But um, it's interesting. Whenever Israel backslid spiritually, they stopped giving monetarily the way they were, the way they were supposed to. In other words, there was a, there was a, a connection between their heart for God and, and their wallet, their pocketbook. Their, their, their credit card, their checkbook. So we've looked at giving before the law. We've looked at giving under the law. Now let's look finally at giving after the law. Or we could say it this way, giving after Christ or according to Christ. And that brings us to the New Testament. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, does the New Testament teach the same pattern of giving as we've just seen in the Old Testament? Be careful, it's a trick question. The answer is yes, it does. You're like, wait a minute. Why did you spend all that time showing us that and we know where you're going with this thing? Well, let me say it this way. The New Testament contains an exact parallel to the Old Testament pattern of giving in that there are two kinds of giving. There's mandatory giving and there's voluntary giving. The mandatory giving is our modern day tax system, (laughs) which corresponds to the Old Testament tithe system. We are mandated, we are commanded by God to pay taxes to the government for the services that they provide for us. Romans chapter 13 Verses six and seven talk about that. Jesus himself encouraged his disciples to pay their taxes and even provided for them by going fishing, right? And finding, you know, coins in fish's mouths to pay for their taxes. Telling them to render under Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus did mention the word tithe two times in the gospels. However, it was in reference to the spiritual show-off self-righteous Pharisees, Matthew 23, Luke 18. The only other time the word tithe uh, is mentioned in the New Testament is in Hebrews chapter 7, where the writer was simply uh, recounting the story of Abraham and uh, Melchizedek uh, and the tithe that Abraham gave uh, that we already looked at back in Genesis. Beyond these three instances, there is no mention about the necessity of paying a tithe or giving 10% in the New Testament. And I think that's because tithing mainly served as a form of taxation to support the government. And beyond the rate that we're required to pay for our taxes, there's nowhere in the New Testament does it say we're bound to any fixed amount or percentage that we're required to give or mandated to give to God. We're simply told to give freely and generously to the Lord. And all that to say, we come full circle that through the person and work of Jesus Christ, the concept of tithing has been replaced by what is referred to as grace giving. In other words, we're no longer under obligation to tithe, to give 10% of everything the Lord gives us. Now, before you breathe a sigh of relief and go, whew, man, I don't feel so guilty anymore. I want to be quick to add that giving 10% is the least we should do in light of the grace that we've been shown in Christ. Our gratitude as God's people living on this side of the cross should be greater than those living before the cross and, and so therefore our giving should be greater as well. In fact, from the very beginning of the church, it was obvious that that being out from under the law and living under grace didn't mean that Christians would give less, but more than their Old Testament brethren. I love the testimony of the early church that we see in Acts chapter 2 and and, uh, in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 33 It says, with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. 
What a great phrase. Abundant grace was just, just all over them. They were just dripping with God's abundant grace. And then the very next verse says for. It gives a reason or, or, or uh, I guess an example of this abundant grace. It says, for there was not a needy person among them for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, was translated to mean sons of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so this whole idea of being, uh, having, um, uh, having abundant grace all over you made you a gracious, generous person. And, and, and there, was, there were no needs. Everybody's needs were met. Why? Because... These early believers, these brand new Christians were were so generous and so quick to give because they realized how much they had been given in Christ. In light of that, it's sad to see the studies of American Christians that show that we give an average of between 2 and 3% of our income. I think something is drastically wrong when we give a fraction of what people in the Old Testament gave. Randy Alcorn, who, um, if you know anything about his testimony, has just been a very uh, generous giver over the years. God has blessed him um, in many ways, and he just continues to give and give and give. And uh, he's written a book called Money, Possessions, and Eternity, you might be more familiar with the treasure principle. That's the one we have in our resource center. Would highly recommend for you to get and read. Um, but this is money, possessions, and eternity. He said this, quote, to me, giving less than a tithe is simply not an option. Someday I'm going to stand before God and give an account of my life. In that day, I do not want to have to explain why, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit and having lived in the most affluent nation in human history, I failed to give at the very minimum level of those who did not have the indwelling spirit and own far less than I. All that to say that we shouldn't consider 10% a, a goal to aim for, but I think the bare minimum to begin with. It's kind of a helpful guideline. And when we started Lakeside, one of the men in, sitting in the living room, we were discussing offerings and giving, and he, he just said, you know, uh, what if we just committed at least 10% of whatever comes in to missions, to outreach, to sharing the gospel locally and around the world? And we all looked around and thought, that sounds cool. That sounds biblical. Let's do that. And so we've strived to maintain that all these years. In fact, every year around this time when we redo the budget uh, for the next year, uh, the discussion comes up as elders, hey, can we push this any further? Can we add another missionary? Can we add another outreach uh, project or program so that we can get beyond 10% to to 15%? And and there's some of our elders that are like, they're not going to be happy until we get to like 25%. Of, of all the money that the Lord provides this church goes to missions. But again, it, we're just using that as kind of a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a starting point of what we should give. And see, when you understand this concept of, of grace giving, as it's often called, rather than asking the question, how much does God expect me to give? The question becomes, how does God expect me to give? It just simplifies the whole thing. And while the New Testament does not mandate how much we should give, it does give us principles by which we can determine how we should give. And, and those principles are concentrated here in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And Lord willing, next week we'll look at those principles. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for uh, your generosity to us, your amazing grace to us in Christ, which should just make us the most generous people on the planet, the most gracious people on the planet, so ready to give, so ready to serve, so ready to sacrifice everything, including our our life for the cause of Christ. 
And so, Lord, as we launch into our uh, mid, uh, midterm plan uh, for this trellis project, Lord, we need your continued wisdom, your continued direction, your provision. And so, Lord, would you bountifully bless this body of believers with the resources to be able to contribute to your work and your way and your time. And so, Lord, and do it in a way that you'll get the most glory and honor from it, that we wouldn't try to get any glory from it um, to ourselves, but all the glory would be to you. Because, Lord, we know that we have nothing but that which has been given to us by you. And so, Lord, would we give back to you as much as we possibly can, uh, Lord, in a way that, that honors Christ and reflects uh, the gift that we've been given in him. We pray this in his name. Amen.